invite you as a congregation to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. This morning we're studying a couple of my favorite passages that are in Scripture that I've learned to love and encourage me through some times of life, and just want to share them with you today. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Listen to God's word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for by the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What a beautiful passage. So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I just sense that there's just a lot of weariness around us. A lot of people that are just sick and tired of everything. You agree? You see it in the stores that we interact in, you've got to wear these masks, and people are grumping about that. You see it at work, people are just wondering what's going to happen. You know, There's just a lot of uncertainty and ugliness out there, and then people are just getting sick and tired, and we don't know what to do. And in this passage this morning, we learn that we're not to grow weary and lose heart. Because it would certainly be easy just to, to throw in the towel and quit and just give in and just go along with the world, right? Why spend time in prayer? Why spend time studying God's words? Why spend time on a beautiful Sunday morning in church? Why... Why, why give in to all that and let's just live with the rest of the world? Let's live in sin. Let's live in anger. Let's live in jealousy. Let's point fingers. Let's just, just quit, shall we? Nobody likes a quitter. Nobody likes those that just give up and say, I'm done. In the 1992 Summer Olympics, that was their first year that we lived in, in Carmel, it featured two tremendously heart-rendering moments. There was an American sprinter named Gail Devers, and she was clearly the one that was going to win the 100-meter hurdles. But she tripped over the last hurdle. As she tripped, she lay there and watched the other runners go past her. She agonizingly pulled herself up, got on her knees, and then crawled, crawled, five meters to the finish line, finishing last nevertheless, but she finished. She could have gave up, but she went to the Olympics to finish the race. But even more emotionally during that same Olympics, was the 400-meter semifinal in which British runner Derek Redmond, as he was running, tore his hamstring, and he fell to the ground right in front of the audience where his parents were sitting. He fell hard on the track. He again struggled first to his knees and then to his legs. He could hardly move, and he hobbled and determined to complete the race. What was beautiful here was that his father jumped out of the stands, jumped onto the track, and helped him to the finish line. Derek and his father refused to quit. Now what's so beautiful about that is Derek couldn't do it on his own. He needed the help of someone else, his father. And they finished together. As I think of that, we're not in this race alone, are we? We don't th stumble through life all by ourselves. 
We have those who are sitting close to us, our family and friends that help us along in our faith, that encourage us in our faith. But also remember, we have a Father in heaven that knows us by name and says, I'm going to help you so that you will not grow weary and lose heart and say, I quit. God is there with us. I love hearing stories of people who won't give up and who will not quit. Because quitters are not much of an inspiration for anyone, is it? You don't hear about them in the news. They're not on the cover of Newsweek magazine. And they are very rarely remembered. Quitters, you don't hear about them. But people... People of faith who stay with a commitment, even though times get tough, they struggle, times it's easy to get weary. We can move on ahead with inspiration from God's Word. And every one of us can probably tell a story of someone that they knew who would have been very easy to give up, but they didn't quit. There was a man that came up to Jesus one time and said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I want to be your disciple. I want to be your help. I want to be there to take care of you and follow you. I want to be one of your guys. And Jesus told him, before you make that kind of a commitment, you need to realize that foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you may follow me, you may be part of one of my core, but I'm going to tell you that there's going to be difficulties. There will be times that you will not know where you'll sleep or where your next meal is coming from. There will be difficult and discouraging times as a follower of Christ. But after you realize that, and when you put your hand to the plow, you don't look back. My friends, as we follow Christ, it's not always easy. It's time, it's time to say, it's just, I, I don't know if I can do this or not. But when we make that true commitment, we continue going forward and, and don't, don't, don't look back. And that's the reason Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 is so very important. Because many of you know the Apostle Paul compared the Christian life oftentimes to athletic events. And he does so in this same passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. And he said, as we're running, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who by joy endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Why did he do that? So that we will not grow weary and lose heart. As Paul shares with us this morning, he's not comparing the Christian life to a wind sprint, but more to a marathon called life that goes on and on and on. <laughs> You see, in a wind sprint, you run as fast as you can for a short distance of time to see who is the fastest. But in the race that Paul is talking about us today, it's not who's the fastest. It's the one that can do, who can endure. The one who does not grow weary and lose heart. Paul was so very faithful. In his last letter to Timothy, a pastor friend, he writes this. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now in store for me is the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Not only to me, but for everyone who longs for his appearing. I love that. And I hope that every one of us when we come to that point in our life where, where life is coming to a close, that we can all say, I have finished the race, and I have kept faith. 
even in the society that has all this garbage on, going on around us, that we can say, I have kept the faith, and I'm moving on. So as we look at the scripture passage this morning, finishing the race is critically important as followers of Christ. But there are three things that I believe that we need to look at this morning. First of all, we have to be inspired by those who have gone before us. Paul says we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And you can be inspired by those who have lived life before us, and we can look to them for help. The passage that we start out with starts with the word what? What does it start out with? Therefore. Okay. Whenever you see a therefore, you have to look at the previous verse. So we go back to verse 11. 11 and 12 go together, and in verse 11 it gives a long list of those people that have been faithful in their walk of faith. So let's go to chapter 11, verse 7. By faith who? Noah. Noah. What did Noah do? Yeah, he built the ark. Nor, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his what? Faith. Faith. He condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, Noah. I need to look at Noah now and then because I confess to you this morning that patience is not one of my finer points of life. Okay? I know I drive my family absolutely nuts because I think that things have to be done on Brad's time, not on anybody else's time. And my time goes pretty fast. we got to go. You know? Yesterday, getting ready for Danica's party, you know, Carla's getting ready for the pictures, Danica's getting ready for her things getting set up, and they were just not moving fast enough, you know, and I'm getting, you know, we gotta go, you know, how many times did I say, you know, people are gonna be here in a few minutes, we gotta go. And it all worked out, didn't it? It all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting me to stand in line someplace just drives me absolutely bonkers. You know, I was going to get something to eat at a drive through the other day, and, and there were all lines of cars. I'm like, I can't stop. I'm not going to wait there. you got to keep on moving. You know, I am not a very patient guy. But Paul says, okay, let's think about this. When you're frustrated, angry with everything that's going on around you because it's not moving at your pace, think about Noah. So when I'm sitting in line thinking, why is it taking so long? Or I'm dealing with a family issue saying, why is it taking so long? I need to hear Noah whisper in my ear saying, hey, Brad, think about me, buddy. You've been waiting here probably five minutes. It took me a hundred years to build the ark. And it wasn't easy. And over that hundred years, I preached to the people to repent, to turn to God. And nobody listened to me. So Brad, he says... When you're feeling frustrated that the church isn't growing fast enough, or you don't have enough people listening to you, or you have to wait in line an extra 10 minutes, listen to me, Brad. Have patience. Because I kept on building the ark when the floods came to the ark. It was a way of salvation for my family. Brad, can you hear me? Keep on keeping on and, and relax and, and trust God. Noah was one of the great clouds that went before us. But then look at verse 8. What does that say? By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later to receive as his inheritance, he what? Obeyed. Obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. Abraham was called for a pretty good life. He, he was a man of faith. He loved God. And he was call, called to go to a place where he did not know where he was going. And was Abram a young teenager when God called him? No, he was old. He was very old when he was told that his wife would be having a baby. And what did they do? They laughed. Sarah's going to have a son. But Abraham obeyed and what? Yeah. He went. It wasn't easy. But as you read his story, he passed every test. 
So I look at Bob and Julie in the back row there. Are you paying attention, Julie? Okay. How would it be if God came to both of you and said to you guys, I want you to move. Pack up your belongings in that nice silver van that you got, and you just start heading south. And when you get to the Mexican border, just go through customs and keep on heading south, and I'll tell you when to stop. How would you feel? <coughs> Julie says no. Not in that van. Not in that van. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think about it, that, that's a pretty big undertaking. So what do I learn from Abraham? Those, those times that God challenges me to say, hey Brad, you know, think about doing this. Or where do you go? And Abraham whispers in my ear and says, Brad, just obey God. Even when you think it's absolutely crazy to do what God is calling you to do, just, just be faithful. Just listen. Because God's ways are higher than your ways. Listen and be true to His will. And there are times in our society God may be challenging us, I don't know what, but to maybe to stand up for, for truth and righteousness, to be bold about our faith. And God is saying, just, just, just be faithful to me. Trust me. It's going to be okay. But then let's go to verse 22. Oh, here, it's a great guy. By faith, what? Joseph. Joseph. When his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Joseph. Man, he had quite a life, didn't he? The favorite son of his father received a, a beautiful, colorful coat, made his brothers all angry and mad because dad likes him better than us. They kidnapped him and threw him in a hole. Now, it doesn't make you mad already, right? That your brothers would do that. But then they sell you to a group of traveling merchants. And they bring you down to Egypt. You get into the, the temple of the, the people that are pretty popular in the leadership. And, but then you're enticed by a lady that, that wants you to go to bed with her and Joseph was a man of integrity and says no and he runs away and he's hauled to court and not judged rightly and he was thrown to prison. You know, Joseph started thinking I'm doing everything right God. I, I love my father. He gave me a coat and my brothers hated me. They threw me in a hole. I went with, went with these traveling salesmen to Egypt and now you know, this woman wants me to go to bed with her, and I, I'm not going to do that. I'm trying to do what's right, God. And, 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 and now I'm in jail, and I'm in prison. Man, he'd be pretty low, wouldn't he? He was accused of crimes he didn't commit. And, man, he was probably just thinking, well, why, why do I even do this anymore? And yet he remained faithful to God. And even he learns this, when people mean it for evil, what? God meant it for good. When you're surrounded with people trying to tear you down and bring you down and people mean it for evil, God means it for, for good. And everything changes for Joseph. He's out of jail He's the prime minister of Egypt. He's in control of all the money and the grain for the whole country. And when he's at the top, he's still faithful to who? God. So listen to Joseph's words. As he whispers in your ear, look, he says, guys, it doesn't take much to be faithful when everything's going your way. But when you're at the bottom and everything seems to be falling apart, Make sure that you're still faithful. When everything seems to be falling apart with this so-called pandemic, 
there's those that say that we need to shut down the economy for, for what is it, six weeks? Shut it down totally? Let's ruin their whole economy? When you're wondering about your job and wondering what you do, oh, just, listen to Joseph. He says, when life seems terrible, make sure you're still faithful. And the list goes on in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses and Samson and Samuel and David and others. And you know what? All these people are in this cloud of witnesses that are saying, Sue Ann, keep on going! Mike, when it gets tough, let's keep going! They're the ones that are cheering you on. And they're saying, don't, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't quit. But there are other witnesses that are cheering us on, right? Not only the great saints in Scripture, but those who have gone before us, who have inspired us. Those who have gone before me. The most unlikely people that teach me about love and grace. Herman Schultz was 85 years old when I met him. He spoke with a deep, deep Dutch broke, or not Dutch broke, German broke. He was one of the Nazis in World War II. He was one of them that went through Amsterdam. Gathering the Dutch Jews to load them in train cars that would bring them to the concentration camps where they met their death. When I met Herman, he shared with me the pain of his past, and that still haunts him to that day. But he said, Brad, he said, I can only live by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Because the things that I have done in the past were ugly and evil. But it's only Christ that can forgive me. If Christ can forgive a guy that was that evil at one time, he can forgive us. Herman is one that went before me. I met Neil Brugink, a man who loved his word and loved his church, telling me to be faithful. And Jim, I'm sure you could share stories of how your dad would encourage you today, right? I met Sue Hen's dad, Harold Lenters. Not a very big guy, but big in faith. And how he would meet with me in Sioux Center as a young pastor to pray over me. My dad taught me many things, but he taught me about faith. Keith, I'm sure if I would sit down with a cup of coffee with you, you could share with me those who have gone before you and who have influenced you and your faith that brought you to where you, where you are today, right? Yeah. Kirk, you probably have friends and those who have gone before you and have built your faith. Bruce, how about you? No? Kirk, certainly you. Danica. Right? No? Struggles will come. And Paul, the writer of Hebrews, says... Prepare for the struggles you're going to face in life. And he says, as you're running this race, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles the run that you have to, to run. I read the words, the sin that so easily entangles. The Hebrew writers are saying, you know, that's like all the garbage you carry in life you have to throw off. So, Kirk, I want you to get up to the camera so we're going to be doing something different. Mike, I want you to come up here. And uh, let's see, who else should I pick on? Uh, Ryan. God, he's supposed to look away. Okay. Look away. <laughs> okay, Ryan's the young guy, Mike's the old guy. Okay. So, who do you think is going to win the race? If we have a race, I want you to leave this, start right now. I want you to run out those doors, run around Bob's van, and come back as fast as you can. Who's going to win? I will. You think... I'll take that. You'll take that? No, as a hill win. Right? <laughs> you think, what? You're just a, a young guy. 
one guy trying his hard. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but anyway, Mike, here. While you run, I want you to carry this. That's sim. Okay. okay. You use sim? Yeah. Okay. Just one little sim? <laughs> no. No? Okay. So then you gotta carry the chair. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, you you sim? Yeah. More than just a couple little sins? Yeah. Okay, what else? Let's, let's put this down here. This is just a little sin, that little lie that you told the other day. Okay. Okay? You good with that? Yeah. Okay. Ryan, you sin? Yep. No, not really? Yeah. Well, here, let's let's help you out, too. Just start stacking. Start stacking. <laughs> <laughs> you. I need to get rid of this stuff. You want to run like that through life? No, but if you don't move, that chair's going to fall. Just keep holding it. Come on. So, you start getting rid of this stuff. You say, God, I'm sorry. I blew it. We're going to let you hold on to yours for a while yet. Yeah? And slowly, you're forgiven. And you can run the race. Like you said it so beautifully, all you have to do is say, I'm going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. And you just say, I'm sorry. I blew it. But you know what? He takes it away that you can go through life again. Thanks, guys. How many of us are just overwhelmed with the stuff that we carry from years ago? Stuff that we've done that keeps on haunting us and, and keeps on coming up. And all we got to say is, God, I'm sorry. I blew it because I want to run this race. I want to go fast. I want to get through it. And all we have to do is say sorry. And he takes all that stuff, all that garbage, and sets it aside. Running the race. But also, running the race... Now, obviously, you can look at me, right, and see that I'm not a marathon runner. You understand that, right? I'm not even a sprinter. If there was a cow chasing me, I'm sure the cow would outrun me, okay? <laughs> but marathon runners tell me that there are two critical times in their race. The first one is right at the beginning. You get to that starting line, you're feeling good, and the temptation is to run way too fast. And depending on your strength, if you start out too fast, you're going to peter out, right? That's usually the sign of a new Christian. I love Jesus. He's forgiven me. And I'm ready to run this race. And we just leave the line sprinting. Oh, slow it down because it's not a sprint. It's a long race of life. So God says... Hey, take each moment you have and enjoy it. The second most critical time in the, is the halfway point. And you realize that you're just only halfway. And you feel your strength giving out and you're thinking, oh my, i got a long ways to go. And marathon runners will call it hitting the wall. And when you're at that point, you start listening to your inner voice saying, you can't do it. You're tired already. Your muscles are aching. You've got a long ways to go. You can't do it! 
And then you start listening to the crowds that are gathered around you saying, look, it's, you're getting slow. You're looking bad. Are you all right? Oh, that person's never going to make it to the end of the race. And we start listening to the people around us. And it's then that, oh, I guess I can't do it. I'm going to give up. Who are we called to listen to? God. And there's going to be a lot of discouragers in the world that say, give up. Don't try. It's not worth your time. Quit the race. But I say, don't, 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 don't give up. And to keep that from happening in your life, hold on to the promise that we find in Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him. And what? He shall lead your path. It's not any simpler than that. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and He will lead you. And the last thing that we learn from this passage in Hebrews is fix your eyes on Jesus. The final advice is this. Look to Jesus. When all this garbage is going on around us, when you hear about all the division and the anger, pray! Seek Jesus. Spend some more time in prayer. Listen again to parts of verses 2 and 3. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Consider him so that you do not lose heart and become weary. Think of Jesus. Jesus was opposed, he was persecuted, he stayed the course, he ran the race, and the price that he paid was for our sin. Every person needs to hear this because it's easy to quit. It's easy to say, I just can't do this anymore. But we learned this morning, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of your faith. And one day, all of us will stand before the judge. <clears throat> Our race is over. And the judge will say, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Don't look to the world because they will lead you off course. <clears throat> Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look to Him. You're going through tough times. When you say, I just can't hardly take it anymore. Just go to a quiet place and start whispering the name Jesus. Jesus. Oh, how I need you right now, Jesus. Jesus. And He will be there for you. The news, the media, maybe the friends that you work with, some of your family members are saying, listen to me. Listen to us. But we just need to say, Jesus. How many of you here have been to Williamsburg, Virginia and toured the historic places there? Anybody? Okay. It's an amazing place. And if you go and tour the, the court system there, they'll explain to you why you hold up the hand and swear that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Why do you hold up your hand to give testimony in court? Anybody know? Ty, did you learn that? I was seven. So you were seven. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to medieval times. When someone was being brought to trial for a crime, and the evidence seemed overwhelmingly against them, there was always a way out. 
that person could stand up and say, I plead the benefit of the clergy. When a person claimed that, they would change the whole court system. The clergy would be brought in. And it was up to the clergy to declare whether you were guilty or not. So this person says, I plead the benefit of the clergy. And the clergyman would always select the same scripture, Psalm 51. And that's the confession of David for all the sins that he had committed. And the clergy would hand that psalm over to the person and say, here, read this. It's kind of a forerunner to a lie detector test. And the law stated that if that person could read Psalm 51 without stammering or stuttering or coming to tears, they would be set free because they would be found innocent. But if they stumbled or stammered or cried, they'd be pronounced as guilty. Usually the person that was guilty would read that passage and they couldn't make it through because they would be found guilty. But if an innocent person did read it perfectly, they'd be found innocent and they'd be brought to another part of the, the building there where they would be branded on the palm of their hand the sign of the cross. A person was only allowed once to claim the benefit of the clergy. And that's why you were always asked, raise your right hand. If they saw the, benefit of the cross on your hand, they would already realize that you have been forgiven once already. Turn to Psalm 51. In the Reformed tradition, we'd often use Psalm 51 as a prayer of confession. As we'd open our worship service and just come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. But as I read this psalm, a beautiful passage of Scripture, place yourself in David's shoes saying, I blew it. Listen to God's word. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassions, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and have done what is evil in your sight. And you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire the truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost places. And David is so beautiful here where he says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and the tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth, and I will declare your praise. You do not delight in a sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And your good pleasure makes Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. 
then bowls will be offered at your altar. David was a broken man. I blew it, he said. But he said, it's only through you, God, that I can have life. And then I will sing. Today, when we live in this world, it's easy just to give up. To lose heart and to become discouraged. Churches are shrinking at an amazing rate today. First of all, some of them aren't even open yet. Can you believe that? People are looking for faith and they're not finding it. And they need us. So man, when you go back to school, those kids need Christ. You can't openly just say it, but let your life live for them. Mike, in that factory that you work at, people need Christ. Share. Kirk, where you pour cement at? You come up with grunky, grumpy contractors and let them see the light of Christ in you. People need Christ. Say the words, Jesus. 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 And we'll be amazed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word today. It's just a beautiful word. That we're running this race and it's not easy. It's pretty hard. With all the ugliness around us, it's easy just to sit back on the sidelines and watch others run the race. It's easy just to quit and say, I can't do it anymore. But help us to turn to the author and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus. Jesus. And let us run this race with perseverance. And that when we come to the end of our race, that our Lord and Savior say good job high five well done well done amen say it with me jesus jesus did you say it? jesus it's a powerful name it's the name we cry on and hold on to as we run this race go now with the blessings of god the father the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and run the race and enjoy this beautiful day.